I'll be reading from this book, Two Girls of Gettysburg. And I've been here since 1989. So that's a lot longer than you. You said 11 years. Did I say 11 years? I meant 21 years. I guess I can't remember. That's why I taught English, rather not math. Uh, Two Girls of Gettysburg tells the story of Lizzie and Rosanna, who are cousins and best friends at the beginning of the Civil War. Um, Lizzie is born and raised in Gettysburg in the north, and Rosanna is born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. So the tensions of the war aggravate their friendship caused them to have a sort of a misunderstanding. And um, Rosanna, um, when a boy that she thought she loved um, dies, she runs back to Richmond where she rekindles an old romance and ends up marrying this young man named John Wilcox who then enlists and goes to fight for the Confederacy. Meanwhile, in Gettysburg, Lizzie's father and brother have enlisted for the Union, leaving Lizzie and her mother to take care of the family's butcher business. And when her cousin runs away, Liz is hurt. She has to quit school to run the family's butcher business. She learns that her father has been taken captive by the Confederates, and there's this constant fear of the rebels coming to Gettysburg. So there's this, um, both girls are actually tested and suffer quite a bit before the Battle of Gettysburg even begins, and the battle itself occupies the whole second half of the book. Um, I wanted to write a book about the Civil War from a perspective that we don't often hear, that of civilians and young women in particular. And in fact, the character of Lizzie is based on an actual girl who lived in Gettysburg who was 15 years old during the battle. My other intention was to get the history right, the movements of the troops, the day-to-day, -day, even hour-to-hour -hour Battle of Gettysburg. And um, so I... Um, made Lizzie and Rosanna not just passive observers of the war, but really active participants in the events. And um, I'm going to read you a few scenes that deal with the battles, with um, the, the girls' perspective on the events that unfold. So um, this first is a, a journal entry from Rosanna, whose husband, like I said, enlists for the Confederacy, and then he's wounded. And he sends his valet, Tom, uh, uh, one of the black slave, to Rosanna to say, come and take care of me. And this is Rosanna's journal entry. Arriving at Warrington Junction yesterday afternoon, we expected to find only a few convalescents remaining as the army had moved on. Instead, a scene of chaos greeted us. There were hundreds of new casualties from a battle at Manassas, the second one to be fought at that place. Some of the injured were being placed aboard trains to Richmond, while others were taken to makeshift hospitals nearby. I saw a dead soldier for the first time. The man's face had been shot entirely away and his body was unnaturally swollen. I turned away and vomited into the bushes. I was ashamed, but Tom said he'd seen grown men do much worse. After I drank some water, I dared to look at the body again, and this time felt a great sadness that would have overwhelmed me had I paused to dwell on it. It was John who saw me first and shouted my name. I ran to him, trying not to step on anyone in my haste. We kissed with restraint due to the presence of so many people, though no one paid us any heed. John's face bristled with a new beard that scratched my cheeks. Why aren't you lying down, I asked him, noticing a bandage around his head. His hair stood upright, stiff with dirt. I'm much better. My ribs are not broken after all, he said, causing me to catch my breath and demand to know all that had happened. In the middle of the night, the alarm was raised. By the sound of horses, it seemed to be a cavalry attack. I grabbed my rifle and rolled out of my tent when, so they tell me, I was struck in the chest by a horse's hoof and knocked down. Whether I was kicked again or hit my head on a rock, I don't know. Don't remember a thing. He shook his head ruefully. Turns out it wasn't an attack at all. Only some horses that had broken loose and stampeded through the camp. I tried to get him to lie down and rest, fussing over him in a manner I deemed wifely. But he refused saying he had to help sort the wounded. Then he took my hands and said, full of tender concern, Dearest Rose, I would not have asked you to come if I had suspected fighting would break out again. I could not have stayed away knowing you were hurt, he murmured, touching his head. At least you were not in the battle. You were almost fortunate to be kicked by that horse. No, it was our first test as a regiment, and though we routed the Federals, I failed by not being there, John said in a grim voice. I knew that his sense of honor had taken a blow. Just then, a man lying on the ground not ten feet away cried hoarsely, Nurse, water. 
I saw two women who appeared to be nurses in the distance, but none close by, and realized he was imploring me. I appealed to John, who looked about until his gaze came to rest on a man lying beneath a nearby tree, his face covered by a ragged cloth. John walked over and detached the canteen from the dead man's waist and shook it. Water sloshed within. He handed me the canteen and nodded. I bent down and held the canteen to the man's lips. I had to lift his head with my other hand. He smelled of sweat and blood. I had never been so close to a man who was a stranger to me, and I felt myself blush. But he gulped the water and murmured his gratitude as if there were nothing improper in what I had done. Kneeling there, I breathed a prayer of thanks that it was not John who called helplessly for water or who lay in the stillness of death. What else can I do to help, I heard myself say. John took me to the assistant surgeon, Dr. Walker, who was so desperate for nurses he merely pointed to a box of bandages and it handed me a pitcher, a basin, and a small flask of spirits. Save the whiskey for the worst cases, he ordered. He turned away and I stood there stupidly. I had no idea how to determine a worst case, let alone treat one. Seeing my confusion, John advised me just to clean the minor wounds. I thought he would stay beside me, but then he was called away. Finding myself alone, I commenced nursing those whose needs were within my small ability, wiping, wiping away dirt and blood, and giving water and reassurances that I hoped were not in vain. The unaccustomed sights and smells bewildered me and nearly made me sick, and I doubt that I did much good. I thought to myself, I have come to nurse my husband, and here I am wiping the wounds of strangers? Later I found John cleaned his wound and clumsily applied a fresh bandage. I asked him where I might find a bed to sleep in. He laughed and led me to a spot beneath a tree where he had devised a makeshift tent and placed my bedroll. Am I to sleep on the ground? I said in disbelief. A man in the army learns to sleep anywhere, he answered. But I am a woman, I said. John looked embarrassed. He knelt down and unrolled the bedding. You're going to sleep beside me at least. After all, I came here to be with you. John smiled. No, it would be unseemly. Darling, you shouldn't even be in camp, except that you are helping Dr. Walker. Tomorrow, I'll settle you in a proper tent. A proper tent? I repeated, finally understanding that I was to have no privacy with my husband and even less comfort. But I was too tired to argue further. I lay down and covered myself with a blanket. The ground was uneven and the noises of frogs and crickets Cries of pain from the injured and shouting and laughter kept me awake for a long time. When the first rays of light woke me, I was so stiff and sore I could barely stand up. Okay, so Rosanna becomes a, a nurse, and at this time, women really weren't nurses, but just the incredible need of, uh, for, for nurses um, meant that women were sort of drafted and learned on the spot. So she becomes, she does this really more out of selfish reasons at first, but she learns, she develops a real unselfish, and she really finds a calling as, as a field nurse. Um, meanwhile, back in Gettysburg, that's jumping again, jumping up to the summer of 1863. Um, Gettysburg is like the hub of a wheel, and all the roads leading into Gettysburg are spokes, and at this time, there are Union and Confederate troops converging on Gettysburg more by chance than by design. And um, on July 1st, there's a skirmish outside of town. And by nightfall, the Confederates have taken over the town, and the Union troops have fled to Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, um, where they sort of dig in and reinforce uh, and wait for reinforcements. Um, my character, Lizzie, is in town when the battle unfolds. Her mother sends her to a place of greater safety. A, a farm about four miles south of Gettysburg, which is in the shadow of Little Round Top and Big Round Top, which, if you know anything about the Battle of Gettysburg, that's where the, the action unfolded. The second day, there was a terrible battle at Little Round Top. So she's really going from the frying pan into the fire, but she doesn't know that. Um, the scouts, the Union scouts, come to the farm looking for information about how to place their, their troops to, to, um, to hold that end of the line, that's the very end of the Union line, and um, Lizzie knows of a path, an old logging path, that can get them to the top of Little Round Top so that they can move artillery and men into position. So, um, if you know anything about the Battle of Little Round Top, the, the Union troops barely held on. If they had lost the battle that day, the whole Battle of Gettysburg would have turned out much differently. So Lizzie kind of inadvertently um, 
saves the day, if you will, by showing those Union scouts a way up the hill, which she happens to know about because the prior winter she went sledding there with the young man, Martin Weigel, who lives at the farm. So this is the scene where she, um, she takes the, um, um, the general to, to the top of Little Round Top and sees that as the battle begins to unfold. 